Good morning, and a warm welcome to today's service, led by our own worship group uh, in the church calendar. I believe this is known as the second Sunday without Wayne. Uh, <laughs> if I say he's back next week, refreshed, enthused, and ready to go again, he's actually sneaked into the back row today with the family just to check on how we're managing without him. I found out, by the way, the first problem is that these are my reading glasses. I can't even properly see you. So <clears throat> if I keep doing that, you'll understand why. Uh, all the intimations were included on the screen, although let me remind you of the history group's uh, next outing uh, to St. Vigens. That's taking place on Thursday, uh, not the normal Tuesday. So Thursday, the 20th of July. I think he's done it on purpose because it's the first day of the Open Golf as well, but um, uh, 11.30, I think. Are we meeting down there at 11.30? Yes, is correct. Uh, and uh, Gail has asked me to uh, intimate that there will be the, the churches running the gala teas on Saturday, the 5th of August. Uh, if anybody can provide baking, uh, she'd be very grateful or even help on the day. It's 1 to 4 p.m. So that's Saturday, the 5th of August. If you can help with either, Gail's uh, sitting in the back row. And the Puppet Show with Sam Shaw is this Wednesday, uh, 4 to 5 p.m. Just sort of checking about the, the age group of the audience here, puppet shows. But if you know any youngsters or children who might also be interested, could you let them know, uh, please? If you heard that, everyone is welcome, and that's for the purposes of the tape. Uh, it's an all ages thing. So let us worship God, uh, our first hymn, I hope it's a good uh, uplifting kickoff, one with which I'm sure you'll all be familiar, Lord of the Dance.
seated. I'll now invite Esther, who will lead us in prayer. Good morning. This is a time of celebration. King Charles III, summer sun shining, a time of entertaining, barbecues, people dropping by for a glass of wine or coffee. God's word teaches us to be hospitable. Jesus tells us to keep on loving one another as sisters and brothers. And do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. The light of the world shineth, and the victory is ours. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father God, be with us now as we come before you to worship and praise you. Let us remember those who are un unable to be with us this morning. <clears throat> we ask you to bless them. Lord, have mercy. We pray for our congregation here today, also for our minister Wayne and his family. Nice to see them back. What does the future hold? May we remain hopeful that our dreams and goals will come to fruition. Help us, Lord, to trust in you. We give thanks for the many things that delight us. Please forgive us when we forget to praise you and thank you. And when the opportunity comes to witness to others by word and deed about your glorious kingdom, we forget once again. And now in the words Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Esther. Every year for the last 10 years, uh, the Kirk Session has been asked uh, and has granted a request from a man called Kevin Simpson of an organization called Malawi Fruits. Uh, to use the church premises on a Friday and Saturday at the beginning of June. And just over a month ago, you may well have seen the literally hundreds of cyclists taking part in the main event. It's called the Kenamount Cycling Challenge. I wouldn't like to walk up it, never mind take a bicycle. Um, either warming up for the event outside the church, uh, cycling on the roads, or just cooling down afterwards uh, on the muir. Uh, there's invariably a great buzz about the place. Uh, Kevin and his helpers are working hard to keep the cogs of the organizational infrastructure uh, well oiled and, and running smoothly. Uh, as far as I know, he does that, well, it looks to me, uh, he does that very successfully. Uh, and certainly each year he, he comes back for more uh, and there's never a shortage of entrants and participants. The support vehicles, the tents, the start finish lines are put in place on the Friday night, uh, busy throughout the program of activities, uh, and then he packs them all away again on the Saturday evening with the keys to the hall posted uh, through the letterbox in the green, green door. So why do we offer our support free of charge year after year? Uh, with Kevin bedding down in the lounge and using the kitchen area and half uh, and the hall for his team's refreshments. Um, Malawi Fruits is a Scottish charity that was established in 2011. 
uh, to work with partners in Malawi to establish and to grow uh, sustainable community businesses in the north of that country. All the funds raised from the Kenamount Challenge uh, go towards the work that they do. Uh, they, they aim to provide startup finance, uh, they give training, they give support uh, to agriculture and related community enterprises, they encourage smallholder farmers to see their small holdings as businesses, uh, and they provide support and training to develop uh, these fledgling businesses so that they can maximize their income and provide for the education and healthcare needs of their families. Their work involves a three-stage development program, supporting the farmers to grow a cash crop, uh, often for a first time, then irrigating the land so the farmers can achieve two or more crops uh, in a year, and lastly providing crop processing facilities to add value to the crops and further drive up the farmers' incomes and yields. But rather than me talking about it, I hope you'll be interested to see a video that Kevin has put together specifically for us um, to explain and provide examples of the work that they do. Morning everyone, this is Saturday the 3rd of June and it's great to be back in Edsel for the, the 10th Cairn Amount Challenge. It's hard to believe that it's 10 years we've been running this event and we're so grateful to Edsel Church for the use of the church hall in each of these 10 years which has really helped to make this event a success and together over, these, over this last decade we've raised something like £75,000 for the work of Malawi Fruits. So this morning we'd like to tell you what difference that money has made out in Malawi, the, the impact that's made on people's lives. But just at the outset, I just want to say thank you so much for your support over all these years. Malawi Fruits was established in 2011 and over these last 12 years, we've had the privilege of bringing good news to the poor in that area of Malawi. What we want to do today is to tell you about two projects in particular in very different parts of the country. Perhaps it's good to start with a, a reminder of where Malawi is and the, the map on the left shows where Malawi fits into the continent of Africa and then on the right there's a bit more detail and the, the obvious thing to notice is Lake Malawi which really dominates the country and in fact Lake Malawi from top to bottom is the same as the length of England so it's a very substantial body of water. So we want to tell you about two, two projects, one at Equindeni which is in a rural hilly part of Malawi, and the other at Bandawi, which is on the, the shore of Lake Malawi. So in both cases, it's projects with women working in greenhouses. So firstly, we go to Equindeni. I'd like to show you a little video that talks about the work that we do there. <laughs> Welcome to Impali in northern Malawi. And what we see here is a typical farm, a typical garden that a household would have. They're growing maize, but it's always a challenge. The rains are becoming more inconsistent every year. And this year, fertilizers have been very, very expensive and there's been shortages. So this year, the harvest is poor. People will be hungry later in the year. Things need to change in Malawi. With Malawi Fruits, we're not just bringing about change, we're bringing about a complete transformation. Bringing modern farming technology into this traditional situation and bringing a, a transformation that has a huge impact on people's lives. We have a solar pump, which is pumping water to this 5,000 litre tank. From this tank, there's a drip system which feeds the water to each and every plant in all 20 greenhouses. That way we get consistent watering directly to each plant. So it saves water and it makes sure the plants get fed with exactly what they need. 
So with this modern farming technology, the women are learning new skills and learning to produce high quality tomatoes like these. They will get at least 15 kilograms from each and every plant, six times the yield that anyone expects to get in open field farming in Malawi. And that means six times the income. And therefore the women can improve their homes, their children can go to school, everybody in the family can eat better. This is the transformation that this technology is bringing about. The project near Bandawi is really quite different. Um, we have 45 greenhouses there and there are 135 women working in those greenhouses. Having that opportunity to grow high quality tomatoes and to see their household incomes increase really quite dramatically. By having a concentration of that number of greenhouses in one place, it really facilitates good training opportunities. So we have uh, one member of staff who's resident on the site the whole time and their job is to coordinate and train and constantly encourage the women to get the best possible yields and the best possible quality. I don't know if your arithmetic is any better than mine, but if you do the calculation, 45 greenhouses with 315 plants in each greenhouse adds up to an awful lot of tomatoes. In fact, in January of this year, this site alone produce 14 and a half tons of tomatoes. It's a bit ironic because if you can remember back to January, you couldn't buy a tomato anywhere in our supermarket. And as at Equindeni, everything is, is grown in sacks in a very ordered fashion and the water is fed through the drip irrigation pipes. But this is where the difference comes in. Whereas at Equindeni, the water is drawn from a borehole, at Bandawi, the water comes from Lake Malawi, an almost inexhaustible source. And we use these smart pumps, they're called future pumps, solar irrigation pumps. We have eight of these pumping away on the beach on the shore of Lake Malawi. I hope you can see something of the beauty of the country. I always like to show off Malawi because it really is a very beautiful place. So the water is pumped uh, from, the, uh, from the lake to overhead tanks. And each tank feeds uh, two, two greenhouses. Um, so there's a constant supply of water keeping the plants uh, fed with everything that they And as I say, such potential to grow large numbers of tomatoes, but in this controlled environment of a greenhouse, which allows for much improved quality as well as the higher yields. I was in Malawi in November. I went into one of the greenhouses and there was a woman there. She was very busy with uh, with the plants and I suppose really just for something to say. I, I said to her, you know, what is that, that you're doing? And, and she seemed slightly surprised, but she turned to me with this big smile on her face and said, well, I'm growing the best tomatoes in the whole of Malawi. Uh, and she wasn't wrong. And it, it, the women just take such pride in the work that they do. I always say in Malawi Fruits, our mission is to bring some good news to the poor. And we bring good news to the poor in very practical ways. And, and these tomatoes are good news. They're good news because of the news, because of the quality and because of the yield. And most importantly, because that pushes up incomes and, and that translates into children being able to go to school in improved homes and so much more. It's a real buzz on the site whenever the, the harvesting is going on and uh, the, the women carry these baskets of uh, tomatoes, about 20, 25 kilograms in every basket and they carry them on their heads and bring them to the, the chills. Your chill store is, is probably the biggest fridge in Malawi. It's a, it's a 40 foot shipping container that's been adapted. Uh, it's entirely powered by the solar panels on the roof with batteries to back it up. The tomatoes in the chill store are kept at 10 degrees centigrade, which is the optimum temperature to maintain the shelf life and ensure that the tomatoes remain in good condition and that all the tomatoes can be sold. Now, 
perhaps there's a danger I give the impression that, that all this is easy and it, and it really isn't. As you can imagine, there's so much work that our dedicated team in Malawi has to do to enable all this. Training is at the heart of the project. Uh, growing, in greenhouse, growing in a greenhouse is quite different to growing in the open fields, which of course is what the, the women have been used to. So the training is, is continuous. Every single day, there's constant training at all the different stages. The ethos of Malawi Fruits has, has never been to do things for people. It's always been about empowering local people to make a difference in their own lives. They, they have, the, they have the, the ability, of course they do, and they just need some training, some support, some encouragement, some new skills, some new technology, and we can make a real difference. And all of this seems a million miles away from a cycling event outside Angel's church, but there really is a connection. The, the, the funds that have been raised over the years have made such a difference to people in Malawi. So thank you once again for your support and helping to make that possible. I'm not often told, uh, Sheena, my, my voice doesn't carry, <laughs> but clearly it doesn't. Uh, anyway, if this has been of interest, uh, you might even want to make a donation. Uh, then please Google Malawi Fruits, uh, visit their website uh, and find out more. Uh, suffice to say, I'm delighted that Edsel Kirk uh, has contributed in some small way to the work that they do. And I hope the Kirk session will continue to agree uh, to the use of our buildings uh, and the grounds uh, at the start of each June each year for as long as, uh, as, long as they wish. Uh, our second hymn is uh, 159 in your hymn books and it is Lord for the years your love has kept and guided.
now ask Neil uh, Hutchin to come up and read today's lessons. First reading today is from Samuel, First Samuel, uh, verse chapter two, verses one to ten. Hannah's prayer. Then Hannah prayed and said, "My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord, my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God." Do not keep talking so proudly, or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, and by him deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumble are armed with strength. Those who are full hire themselves out for food. But those who were hungry hunger, hungry, hunger no more. She who was born was born seven children, but she who has had many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down the grave and raises up, raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He praises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash sheep. And he, he seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honour. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. Upon them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked will be silenced in darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder against them from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will strength, give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. And the second reading is from Luke chapter 6. Verse 17 to 23. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of the disciples was there, a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by evil, spirits were cured, and people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their fathers treated their prophets. Amen. Thank you. Unlike Alan Watt, I won't ask if you've spotted a common theme, but there is a common theme to those two readings, which I'll try and pick up on uh, in a reflection in a couple of minutes. But before that, we have the third hymn, uh, number 448 in your hymn books and it is lord of the lord the light of your love is shining Set us free by the truth you now 
Are we on? Yeah. Is it significant that uh, when that hymn, before that hymn started, we had grey mist and now the sun has come out? <laughs> the thread running through uh, both of today's readings, and you'll be glad to know, by the way, even though as a university lecturer, my lectures are something like three or, or two hours, um, I did rehearse this one and it was only 12 minutes, so don't worry. <laughs> the thread running through uh, both of the readings, uh, further linking to the work of the Malawi Fruits Organization, is God's care for those less fortunate, the, the poor, the homeless, and the un underprivileged. As some of those lucky enough to have sufficient for our needs, we should reflect on what we have uh, that many in our society and many overseas don't have. With people like Kevin Simpson doing what they can in practical terms to change the status quo and to improve the quality of life for those in developing nations in, in Africa and elsewhere, um, good for them. As the saying goes, give a man a fish and you will feed him for a day. Teach him how to fish, on the other hand, and you may feed him for life. And that seems to me exactly what they're doing. The chances are, uh, Kevin says, that if you're involved with a group like Malawi Fruits, the end of a day while on a trip brings everyone together for a conversation. It's an opportunity to unwind a bit and debrief your experience as that group. Reflections are shared, activities of the day are put into context. Uh, often this time begins with going, going around uh, the group and, and sharing about the day. One way to uh, frame it is for everyone to share one positive thing and one challenging thing about the day. Sometimes it's called highs and lows, uh, but maybe a bitter, iter better iteration of it, uh, hence the photograph that you see, uh, is roses and thorns, which brings the reminder that even within the same flower of a day, uh, there is beauty to behold, as well as prickly things that might take you by surprise. In today's gospel verses, uh, we find a short series of roses and thorns, as described by Jesus uh, to his disciples and the crowd that had gathered around. In Luke's gospel, they're described as blessings and woes. Uh, they're part of a, a lengthy sermon that is paralleled in Matthew's Gospel as well, um, rather than the 107 verses, however, that we hear in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. Uh, Neil would not have thanked me for that. Uh, uh, Luke's Gospel uh, has Jesus only giving a 32-verse sermon uh, known as the Sermon on the Plain. Uh, these verses might sound uh, familiar, because they're uh, echoes of the well-known Beatitudes. Uh, but Luke puts a different spin on things. First, he identifies uh, the blessings uh, or the roses. Now, he identifies the poor, the hungry, the weeping, and those who are excluded and persecuted. And if those examples strike you as odd, as blessings, you're not alone. They're far from that typical list of blessings. Often we associate the word blessing with happiness uh, or good fortune. But in the Greek, apparently, I don't speak Greek, uh, the word makarios uh, goes beyond the superficial uh, or even material possessions. It's a word more closely associated or connected with a sense of unity with God in an internal sense, relating to righteousness and being in the right relationship with our creator. So to be blessed meant living in a keen awareness of the presence of God. It is not uh, to be free from struggle, uh, but to be oriented towards a reality where God's realm is realized. Uh, and in each of those blessings, the struggle comes with a promise of reversal. The hungry will be filled. The weeping will give way to laughter. Uh, these promises echo a, um, echo a sense of hope with a reversal of fortunes for the rich and the poor, the powerful and the powerless, the full uh, and the empty. Luke's words are, are grounded in present reality. 
and our responses to them uh, should be as well. It's perhaps notable that Luke's location is different than Matthew's. In Matthew, we see Jesus taking his disciples to the mountaintop, looking down on the world around them, giving them the big picture. But in Luke, Jesus is on the plane with them. Uh, his words are simple and straightforward. One idea of the location is that he's on the level, uh, which hints that this conversation from Luke's perspective is about Jesus being squarely in step with the realities of our human existence and speaking plainly to us about it. Essentially, Jesus is on the level with us, telling us the truth of our lives as he sees us and confronting us with our responsibility to be part of God's kingdom with our response to what we see uh, in the world. God calls us to be part of the kind of kingdom that Christ modeled. Immediately prior to these verses, uh, and indeed at the, at the beginning of what uh, Neil read to us, Jesus is surrounded by crowds seeking healing, which he offers. Throughout the gospel, particularly in Luke, we find Jesus attending to the very real needs of those who are poor and suffering. We see Jesus acting with love and compassion in a powerful ministry of presence uh, and calling disciples to do the same. For our part, we can reach out to those who are hungry uh, that they might be filled, whether that is through contributing to a food bank or actively being involved with a soup kitchen as some in this congregation used to do. We can offer comfort to those who weep by reaching out with phone calls, uh, with cards or visits uh, and offering friendship and care that gives way to, to laughter. These are ways uh, we can live uh, that can deliver the blessings that Christ uh, teaches, plain and simple. This would be challenge enough, uh, but the gospel pushes us even further as Luke punctuates these blessings with four corresponding statements of woes. These are the thorns, uh, examples uh, given of things that are soon to be upended. These woes um, that Luke identifies are tough ones to hear, particularly if we find that they are descriptive of us. Uh, Jesus, uh, speaking quite freely and plainly, calls the audience and us out of our complacency and away from the safety and security of the laurels that we rest upon. And it says that the reign uh, of God here and now is about something more than just our own accomplishments. In fact, these accomplishments might just be our undoing. So there's trouble ahead if you think you've got it made. What you have in that situation is all you'll ever get. And it's trouble ahead if you're satisfied with yourself. Your current self will not satisfy you for long. Uh, and it's trouble ahead if you think life's all fun and games. There's suffering to be met. And sadly, we're all going to meet it uh, at some time or another. Or does that mean you're just being too Presbyterian? Um, in other words, there's trouble ahead uh, when we live only for the approval of others saying what flatters them and doing what indulges them and for our own well-being. The challenge is to be true, uh, not popular, to think of others more needy and not ourselves in doing what is right, even when that isn't in our own best interests. So this text from Luke calls us to be willing to embrace uh, the kind of upside down reversals that Jesus presents. Luke's version of the Beatitudes is meant to startle us out of our complacency and inspire us to action. God doesn't take kindly to half-heartedness. God doesn't bless us as we maintain the status quo, reaping the accolades of those who hear, hear us and follow us. God doesn't bless us as we bathe in respectability in the eyes of the world. God doesn't bless us as we quietly maintain tradition and gloss over or ignore those voices calling us back to, to God. God does not bless us 
as we protect and build institutions or, or, or empires. God doesn't bless us uh, well off, full, comfortable, hearty and well spoken of. These four pairings anyway, blessings and woes, roses and thorns, challenge us to look at our lives and to look at the world with, with new eyes. They challenge us to clarify our values and examine what are the things in life that we will take a stand for in relation to the way we live our lives. Here are very real instructions for us to reorient our relationships, to reverse the social, the economic, and the political injustices that surround us. Wayne isn't the only one uh, in this church with an interest in history. I never actually studied it formally. My granddaughter was with us and I said, if I was doing my uh, A-levels again, I would do uh, English history, and probably aren't A-levels now, but uh, English history and French, because that's what really interested me rather than maths, physics, and chemistry, which I ended up doing. Uh, totally unsuited, but never mind. Uh, I particularly enjoy 20th century history. Uh, in 1930s Germany, church leaders had uh, such an opportunity, as I've just been talking about. As Adolf uh, Hitler rose to power, he capitalized on fear to abolish uh, rights and democratic processes. Many took uh, the union of Christian Christianity, nationalism, and militarism for granted. Uh, and patriotic sentiments in 1930s Germany were equated with Christian truth. Uh, that quickly led to calls for a racially pure nation uh, with Hitler's rule as God's will uh, for the German people. Thankfully, many did resist that trend, including several pastors uh, and the theologian Karl Barth. Uh, after meeting regionally, uh, they gathered representatives of the Lutheran, Reformed and United Churches uh, in a place called Barmen, in the Gemarker Church in the city of Wuppertal. Uh, and that was at the end of May 1934. There were around 140 delegates, including ordained ministers, church, men, uh, church members, and university professors, who made a declaration uh, to appeal to the evangelical churches of Germany to reject the German Christian accommodation to uh, National Socialism, to proclaim instead the church's freedom in Jesus Christ, who is Lord of every area of life. They made six assertions, all based in scripture, to present a statement of faith that would call the church to faithfulness and the gospel once again. The document helped unify the church in belief, belief and to renew faithfulness against an otherwise unpopular message at the time that they believed was a threat to the gospel itself. The Declaration of Barman uh, is almost a modern, modern blessings uh, and woes. Uh, it proclaimed what the reign of God should be <coughs> and took a firm stand against that which would threaten the very gospel Jesus uh, proclaimed. Ultimately, they did not overcome in the short term uh, the greater threat, uh, but they made a stand and they put out a statement. The church sought collectively to be a prophetic voice to the world, grounded in an understanding of the vision that Christ presented on the plain uh, for the kingdom of God to break into the world. So in the end, that's what the Beatitudes call us uh, to, a better understanding of what it looks like for God to reign, a God who sees all of God's creation as beloved and blessed and calls us to be in a community that models such a perspective. Uh, these words from Luke are not a gospel of comfort, but a gospel of challenge <laughs> to embrace the world with the love and eyes of Jesus. Uh, and shame on us if we miss an opportunity to be part of such a world. Blessed uh, are the ones who are able to live 
in the upside down world of God. For them, the kingdom of God is revealed. So the challenge is to go from this place and to live up to our expectations. Ishbel will now lead us in a prayer of intercession. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us pray. Lord, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your day of rest, when we can come to your house and be part of our church family, to have a special day in the week from other days, a time to reflect, to hear your word and sing your praise. This helps us to prepare for the coming week. You had a day of rest when you made the world and said we should have this too. This has largely come to an end in our world and we can see the result of this change. And Sunday is a day like others. People are stressed and lack family time to be together and have a quieter day without the noise and rush and interruptions of the other weekdays. Help people to rethink and take stock of what is happening and to try a different way. Help them to use the time to reflect and notice your beautiful world. The trees and flowers, birds singing, the changing seasons. And most cities in our country have beautiful parks too. We pray for all the problems in the world today. Each generation have had them all different at different times. But because of the media and contact we have now, we hear so much more. We pray for all the unrest, wars in different places, and fears people have of trouble and fighting in their countries. So many people feel unsafe and afraid in their homes. We pray, Lord, that leaders and governments will see the futility of all this and build up their nations. We pray for all natural disasters which take place, that people will have warnings and have a safe place to go. Give them comfort, Lord, and help and hope. In these situations, may they have help from others. We pray for those who are ill or having to wait for treatment, for the shortage of doctors and nurses and other personnel in the National Health Service. We pray for those who need care, their relatives and families needing advice, for those who are alone and depend on carers to help them. We pray there will be enough staff and personnel able to return to work. These are such vital services, and we pray the staff will again enjoy their work and feel less pressure. The last few years have brought great hardship, worry and stress to all walks of life, Lord. So many are unhappy in their work and don't enjoy what they once loved. We ask, Lord, that you will help a solution to be found for this, why it is happening and what can be done. It seems our world and country is changing so fast in every way. We pray for your church throughout the world, gathering to meet together today to praise you and find strength and comfort in their lives from you. We bring before you our church in Scotland and here at Edsel, the many changes and different suggestions for worshiping and spreading your word, that more people will seek to know you, help us to be good disciples in our word and actions, that although life has changed, your message never changes. Your gospel is full of wonderful advice on how we should live and how we should behave. In 2 Timothy at chapter 3, we read the message from Paul of the way people will start to live lives against what you would wish. And that seems to be the way in our lives at present. We also read of Paul's message on love, what that means and how that can change everything. Also, we can receive the fruits of the Spirit, which again produces love, 
and so much more than we could hope for, bringing us peace in our lives. Your new commandments teach us all of this and to love with all our heart and soul and mind and to love our neighbours as ourselves. Love can change everything. We bring our prayers before you in the name of your precious Son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Ishbel. Our closing hymn has no number in the hymn book, uh, but it is one I think you'll know well in Christ alone.
Into the world, go now with the confidence of God upon your hearts, with courage to share God's shining love and hopefulness to feel God's powerful presence. And the blessing of God, the Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit remain with you now and forevermore. Amen. And tea and coffee is available as usual in the church hall.